Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar on finance and accounting essentials. My name is Jason Bellin, Director of Online Technology at Columbia Business School Executive Education. I'm coming to you today from the Columbia campus here in New York City. I'll be the moderator for today's event, taking all of your questions uh, as we continue um, through, through the lecture. And before we begin, I do want to thank you for taking the time to be with us today. We really appreciate having all of you in the room. and. Uh, we do realize you're very busy, and we, uh, again, thank you for choosing to spend time with us and choosing to focus on your professional development. Um, just before we begin, I want to draw your attention to two things. One is that this webinar really is one of the, the highlight of a program that we have coming up called Mastering Management, the Executive Program in Business Management. That's a 12-day program taking place over four months. Um, I've actually taken the program myself, <laughs> so I've, uh, I can tell you from personal experience that it's a, a fantastic experience, particularly if you are in a position where you've uh, uh, pursued excellence in your field over, over years and risen to a point where you're managing other folks in a cross-functional way and are looking to expand uh, your understanding of uh, business processes, particularly um, the area of understanding finance as you're having more conversations around. Uh, with, with finance folks and around finances within an organization. And today with us uh, is one of the great finance faculty professors uh, here at Columbia, uh, Professor Sid Balachandran. And so he's going to bring us through about a half hour of, of talking about finance account and accounting essentials. I hope you really find this uh, to be valuable. Um, it's, it's certainly one of the highlights of, of the program. And I want to encourage you throughout the presentation to ask questions. That's really, really one of the hallmarks of what we do here at Columbia. It's not just listening to a faculty member, but it is uh, very much engaging with each other and with the faculty. So as we go through, use the chat window, ask questions, talk to each other, um, and I'll be sure that we save time at the end to engage with uh, Professor Belchandran um, and make sure that your questions are answered. Again, I just posted a link in the chat box to the program website, so we welcome you to visit that. Uh, at your leisure and continue the conversation with us after after the event. And with that, I will welcome my great colleague, Professor Sid Belchandran. Sid, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, Jason. It's really my pleasure to be here. I want to also thank everybody for joining us today. And uh, uh, really a, a, an honor to, to get to know all of you a little bit and hopefully one of these days as we go forward, I will also get to know you in one of our classrooms and one of our programs. Uh, specifically today, I want to spend some time talking about a program we have called Mastering Management. And, and within that program, the finance and accounting components that we cover in the program. Uh, the intent of the program is, as Jason mentioned, to give people a broad exposure to some of the key ideas of management. What we have in mind in the program is that as people progress through their career, they usually start by having something they're specialized at, something they're good at. They may start in sales. They may start in marketing. They may start in operations. They may start in finance. They may start in HR. Uh, but over time, as their position in the company grows, as their level of influence over the company grows, as their status and career grows, they're going to constantly be faced with managing people in areas that are not exactly their scope of expertise or their area of expertise. And probably there's no better example of this issue than finance and accounting. So the purpose of this session is that what we'd like to do is we'd like to give you an overview of the key aspects of this program and, and the, the ideas in finance and accounting that we cover. We'd like to make sure you understand why these topics are relevant to you as a business executive even if your main role is not finance and accounting related. And I think a lot of the answer to the second bullet point has to do with what we were saying is that as you move up in the organization, you're going to have responsibility over things and over people that are not necessarily your area of expertise. And in many cases, people rise through the ranks because they are excellent at marketing, excellent at managing the products or the services of the company and managing the business. But when they reach a certain level, all of a sudden, they're handed a P&L and told, you, you have P&L responsibility at this point. And so you know, it's this situation and this place that we really intend this program for. We intend people to become conversant in all the general areas of management, even if it's not exactly their own specific area. 
Uh, we'd like to give you along the way a flavor of the type of teaching methods we use. And we're specifically focused on finance and accounting here for a couple reasons. Uh, one is it's certainly a critical area that often becomes something new that people have to learn. But even more importantly, it's often the most challenging area that people have to learn about when they have not come from that type of background. So if you came from, let's say, an operations background, and all of a sudden you're given P&L responsibility, of all the different things that you have to kind of get your arms around, this one often proves for people to be complex, to be scary, for lack of a better term. And you know, the thought of studying these subjects in a classroom might equally be scary. So what I want to do is not just tell you about what we're going to teach, but also try to give you a little bit of a flavor of how we go about teaching this in a way that makes the concepts more understandable, more accessible, easier to grasp, and doesn't require you to spend the two, three, four years that a typical finance and accounting person spends to become a master of these subjects. Uh, you know, we also want uh, you know to learn through the process what we do to provide resources to support the learning of complex concepts such as finance uh, and accounting. You don't have a, a lot of time, but we need you to devote some time, and we want to find ways to creatively maximize the time you devote to studying this to maximize the benefits that you get out of it. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, particularly with respect to finance and accounting, when you get to a certain stage in your organization, you realize that finance and accounting is no longer just for the bean counters. Right? There used to be a time in business where you could go your entire career without having to know how to read a P&L or without knowing how to understand a balance sheet or without having to calculate a net present value. Um, those days are by and large over. I mean, in, in the old days, it was if that came up, you tossed it over the wall to your finance person. They did that. They came back and told you what to do. These days, things are more complex. Organizations are flatter. There's more pressure on people to be flexible and to know more. And as a result, you had to have at least some degree of hands-on knowledge of the subject, specifically because finance and accounting is what we call the language of business. Uh, it is the terminology and the techniques that we use to make business decisions. It drives a lot of the activities of the business. It's also the approach we use to evaluate how business activities are being run and how well they're being run um, in, in terms of did those activities generate the types of results that we want. So things we want you to understand, we want you to understand the language. We want you to understand the linkage between the things you do as business activities and how they translate into financial results. And finally, what we want you to realize is that these techniques, these tools, this language, really forms the rules of this game that we call business. It's the game that we are all focused on being essentially professional athletes at. And as we grow in this business, if you don't really understand how score is kept, it's going to be very hard to win. So let me quickly give you an overview of the two major topics that we're talking about. One is finance, the other is accounting. The two are very related to each other. Finance really covers the key techniques, tools, and decision-making processes that companies follow in making some of the fundamental decisions that they need to run the business. Central to those decisions are decisions such as what business we should be in, what projects we should invest in, how we should invest and deploy our capital, uh, how we should evaluate performance. Um, and, and the key tool behind all of that is the first bullet point under finance. There's something called net present value, which is a fundamental set of calculations that every finance person sort of knows as the bread and butter of everything they do. Uh, and it's a technique that we'll be teaching so that you'll get a better understanding of some of these finance and accounting issues work. Um, we will take time not just to understand the tools and techniques, but we'll take time to think about how to apply those techniques to real life situations. And we'll also examine how the financial structure of a business actually affects the priorities that the business undertakes. Um, what I mean by this is if you've ever been in a situation where you've looked at your company and said, well, I always thought what was best for business was X, but it seems like management, senior management is pushing us to do something very different. What may be going on in the background is that there may be some element about the financial condition or the financial structure of your business that motivates you to do something. Uh, oftentimes with accounting and finance, um, the, 
techniques of accounting and the techniques of finance that are employed actually drive people to the types of business choices that they make. And sometimes that becomes a little bit backwards. In other words, it feels a little bit like the tail is wagging the dog. We want to get a certain financial result or satisfy a certain accounting treatment. So we make decisions that may not necessarily be the best business decisions, but they're the best finance and accounting decisions. So part of this also requires you to understand how to read the financial information and the key financial statements in accounting, understand how accounting practices drive the behavior in companies, and actually know how to manage through these situations where there are certain financial and accounting pressures, but there are also the real business pressures. And you know, in most cases, if you think about it logically, you should be able to say, well, we should do what's right for the business first and then let the finance and accounting numbers take care of themselves. The sad part and the sad reality is it often doesn't work that way. In fact, originally in my career, I was not an accountant and I was not a finance person. I was actually more interested in marketing and operations and that's actually where I started my career. What I realized was that oftentimes in the company that I was working with when I was working as a management consultant, the marketing and operations issues always ended up sort of taking a back seat to how the finance and accounting was structured and we kind of had this tail wagging the dog situation. So what I learned pretty quickly was that I needed to develop expertise in finance and accounting if I wanted to actually get good business decisions implemented. And that's really, if you think about it, the larger goal of what we want to teach. Okay, so that's a, that's a little bit about an overview of the program, an overview of the motivation. Let me take a few minutes to try to give you an example of how we might teach one of these concepts. I mean, I think normally if I went up to the average person and I mentioned, well, I want you to come and take a class in finance and accounting, they might get a little nervous. These are fairly technical. These are fairly complicated. At the Columbia Business School, we have spent a lot of time over a lot of years teaching a lot of non-financially oriented executives how to understand finance and accounting. And we've come up with ways of getting through this and helping people understand this that is both practical and conceptually correct. So we don't necessarily want everything to be purely technical. We want things to be practical. What I mean by that is we don't just want people to know how the numbers work or how they fit together, but we actually want them to walk away from the program having a really good sense of how to actually use those numbers and actually be able to turn around and apply those numbers in a real life situation. And so we've developed teaching methods, we've developed uh, support resources to get, to get that to happen in a limited amount of time. So what I want to try to do is take you through one example of how we might teach some of those concepts so that you get a little flavor of how a, a typical classroom um, activity might function in learning something like this. <coughs> now what I want to do, and the example I want to use, is to talk a little bit about how we would introduce the notion of accounting and how to think about and how to understand accounting. And the first thing we would tell you if you were in a classroom is you have to realize that there's actually more than one type of accounting happening in a company at any point in time. And there's typically three types. First type is tax accounting, second type is financial accounting, and the third type is managerial accounting. Each of these three types has a very different objective. The objective of tax accounting is to minimize your overall income tax burden. So basically in tax accounting, the, what the accountant is trying to do is find a way to apply, accounting ends up being a set of rules and regulations. The accountant is trying to apply those rules and regulations in such a way that they make the income of the company look as small as possible so that the tax bill is as small as possible. Now similarly, there are a set of rules and regulations governing financial accounting. Financial accounting is the set of accounting that drives how we prepare our annual report to our shareholders, how we prepare all of our external financial reporting that is required if we're a publicly traded or public company in uh, the U.S. or in just about any other country in the world. Um, financial accounting, the objective there is really to maintain good investor relations. So we want our investors to believe that their investment has been a good investment that it is making them money. We want future investors to see a lot of upside in the company so that it's worth coming in and buying the stock. And so if you think about it, with, financial, with tax accounting, we want to make our income look as small as possible so the tax bill is small. With financial accounting, we want to make our income to some degree look as good as possible, which is the exact opposite objective of tax accounting. And then finally, at the end of the day, anytime we make decisions in the company, 
it would be nice if those decisions are informed by data and information about which decision is likely to create the best financial result. And that brings us to our third type of accounting called managerial accounting. So if you think about finance, tax accounting as trying to present the poorest view of our performance as possible, financial accounting is trying to present the best view of our accounting of our results as possible. Managerial accounting is really accounting that we do for ourselves so that we actually know how we're doing. So the way I like to think about this, and the way I like to explain it to my students is, think about each of these three types of accounting as playing a game. And the name of the game in, in tax accounting is the begging game. When the tax man comes to the door, you want to dress in your poorest, most humblest rags, and you want to look like you have very little to give so that they take very little away. Managerial, I'm sorry, financial accounting, on the other hand, you're courting your investors. You're maintaining investor relations. So you want to prepare your financial accounts similar to the way you prepare for a date. You want to dress well. You want to make sure your hair looks good. You want to make sure you smell nice. Uh, these are all things that are sort of dressing to impress. And that's exactly the objective and, and the game with financial accounting. And finally, when it comes to managerial accounting, this game is called to tell the truth. If we're actually making information decisions based on the numbers, we want the numbers to reflect reality as much as possible. Right? We don't want to make decisions based on numbers that are systematically making us look bad or systematically making us look good. I mean, that would be the equivalent of, if you ever know somebody who suffers from either a serious lack of self-confidence or a serious overconfidence problem, what you realize is they often make decisions badly because they're functioning from a wrong view of the world or a biased view of the world. And tax accounting numbers are one bias. Financial accounting are another bias. What we're really trying to do in managerial accounting is make the numbers unbiased. So you know, this is before we get into any of the debits and credits and all the pieces. Really, conceptually, if you understand these three objectives, it helps you with your ability to interact with people who work in accounting and finance because you actually start thinking in terms of where are they coming from? What are they trying to get done? How are they trying to make things happen? And once you're able to think about those things, you're more effective in interacting with them, in managing them if you need to. Uh, and overall, you're able to converse and exchange information in a more efficient way. OK, so one thing you want to think about with, the, with what I just said is the following. What I just said is, as an accountant, one of the things that accountants are capable of doing is they're capable of taking a business and basically making it look as good, good if they want to, bad if they want to, or tell you what's really going on in the business. And what's important to keep in mind is we're talking about one business with one set of things that happened in any given year. We're not talking about three different companies with three different sets of numbers. We're talking about one company with one business activity reported three different ways with three sets of outcomes. And you need to start thinking about, well, what is going on here in the background that actually allows accounting to do something like this? And so what I want to talk about next is how do accountants actually get at this? And what, what, we, what we actually do is we realize that every accounting number contains actually three parts. And the problem is you can't really separate these three parts. The first part is the true number. For any particular thing that's going on in your business, there is some truth that you would like to know about. The hard part is that that truth is often not easy to measure. So that creates a problem of measurement error. Okay. So the way to think about this measurement error is to think about measuring something like the length of the room that you're sitting in. And the issue is, if you took a ruler and started measuring every single inch of the room, depending on where you put the ruler down and where you pick it up, two or three different people trying to measure the length of the room would come up with completely different answers about the length of the room. I mean, they'd be close to each other, hopefully, but they wouldn't get exactly the same number. Okay, that's, so is there a true length to the room? Yes, there is. By this form of measurement, the number that comes back to us, is that number exactly that true length? And the answer is no. The number is the true length plus some error. However, in accounting and in business, we have a lot of discretion in how we measure things. So think about it this way. You probably would get more error if you forced people to measure the length of the room using just a one-foot ruler. You'd probably get less error if they used a yardstick. You probably get even less error if you brought in one of those fancy laser-based devices that you just fit and push a button and lasers go out to both sides of the room and come back and give you a reading. So 
So we have choices over the type of technology that we want to use to do the measurement. And at the end of the day, accounting is just a set of technologies that we can use to measure things. So we have discretion over the technology we use. And in some cases, we re and, and, and the trade-off here is this. A ruler is relatively inexpensive. That laser-based measuring system is costly. So we have to trade off the cost of getting more accurate measurement with the benefits of knowing within, you know, do you need to know this within plus or minus an inch? Do you need to know this within plus or minus one one millionth of an inch, right? Uh, and the answer to that would be it depends. Uh, if it was just me getting ready to buy some carpeting for the room that I'm sitting in, maybe knowing it within plus or minus an inch or two is okay. If I were instead an engineering manager who uh, is going out onto a construction site to lay the foundation for what will become the new World Trade Center, I need to measure things to the millionth of an inch. And so I need to spend more, and I need to use my discretion to find technologies that minimize measurement error. And that's a very unconventional way of thinking about accounting, but I think it's a way that's intuitive, and it helps people understand what's going on in the accounting. Okay. Um, most people, given a technology, without any sort of bias, will come up with the truth and measurement error, which is what we call the Mother Teresa number. Some of what we're going to look at is how can we use technology to make those types of errors smaller so that we can have more reliable information, more relevant information. And then we'll think about how do we use that information through decision-making techniques like net present value to make better business decisions. I know that there's a couple of questions coming in. Uh, Jason is keeping track of them. And as soon as I finish sort of th this portion of it, we will kind of group those questions together and, ad and, and address them as they're being asked. So I, I thank you for your patience for this. Um, but uh, but uh, and some of these questions are really great questions that I really look forward to talking about them. But let me finish putting up some machinery here, and then we will address all the questions in one shot. OK, thank you. Uh, but please keep the questions coming. Um, Okay. All of accounting, which you'll learn in the program, is built around three key financial statements. There's an income statement, which we sometimes call the P&L. There is a balance sheet, and there's a statement of cash flows. The income statement is really simple. In fact, my father was an accountant, and what he used to say is income is a really simple idea. We measure what we receive with the right hand, we measure what we give up to receive it with our left hand, and we hope the right hand is longer. Most income, so income statements are just re tracking revenues and expenses in the business. Most income statements look a little bit more like this. They actually break up uh, the expenses into various categories. What are the costs of the products you're selling? What's the cost of your research and development? What are you selling in administrative costs? If you're borrowing money, what's your interest expense? If you are paying taxes, what's your income tax bill? Um, Every financial statement um, also includes a balance sheet. A balance sheet is a little bit more complicated than the income statement, but the way to break down a balance sheet is as follows. The balance sheet has two sides. On one side of the balance sheet, there's assets. And on the other side of the balance sheet, there are liabilities and shareholders' equity. A simple way of thinking about it is that assets are simply a listing of everything that the company owns. Liabilities and shareholders' equity uh, tell us who owns it and how much of each of it they own. Okay? And as the name suggests, the balance sheet has to balance. Someone, somewhere, owns everything that is inside a company. All the assets have to be owned by somebody. And they're either owned by the people that we borrowed money from or the people who invested the money to start the company. Okay, so assets have to equal liabilities and shareholders' equity. Balance sheets are arranged in what we call a liquidity sequence. Okay, so when you look at a balance sheet, there are two types of assets. There are current assets and there are long-term assets. Current assets are assets that can be converted to cash within a year. And so the most liquid asset in a company is obviously the cash that the company has. But most companies put all their money into less liquid things. They put them into buildings. They put them into factories. They put them into receivables. They put them into inventory. Those, All of those things take a different amount of time before they can be converted back to cash. Generally, things like inventory and accounts receivable 
can be turned back into cash in less than a year. They're called current assets. Things like buildings and factories, it would take you more than a year typically to, if you want to convert a factory back into cash, you'd have to sell it. And typically the cycle for selling a factory is longer than a year, so we think about that as a long-term asset. Also, if you build a factory, your goal is not to build it to sell it oftentimes. Your goal is to build it and use it for the next 30 years to make your products. And so if your intended use of the, pro of, of the asset is a long-term use, then we call it a long-term asset. Same thing on the liability side. If you borrow money, sometimes you borrow with things that you have to repay quickly. Sometimes you borrow with things you have to repay over a long period of time. And so if you, if you have more than a year to repay, that's called long-term. If you uh, have less than a year to repay, that's called current. So balance sheets are organized this way. And what we'll do in the class is we'll start with these basic concepts, and then we'll add a few more so that by the time you're done, if you're handed a balance sheet of your company, you'll be very comfortable understanding exactly what's on there, and more importantly, what's not on there. There are some important omissions from a balance sheet that we'll talk about in the program. And you'll understand how to interpret the data and you have some tools at your disposal saying, based on this data, do I think this company is doing well? Do I think this company is doing badly? Is there something I should be worried about? The last of the financial statements is called the statement of cash flows. The statement of cash flows tracks how money is moving in and out of the company. Essentially, companies generate and spend money for doing three things. The first thing they generate money on is they generate money uh, by selling their products and operating their business. But selling their products requires a sales force. It requires a product. It requires advertising. Those are all called operating activities, and each one of those are things that we spend cash on or get cash from. Investing involves making those kinds of investments that put the long-term assets in place that we need to uh, generate our products and provide our services. Financing says, well, given the balance sheet, how did we get the money for the balance sheet? How much of it did we borrow? How much of it did our shareholders put in? How much are we giving back to them at any point in time? And uh, what's the net amount of cash we have coming in? The, the cash flow statement essentially says, think about your business as if you're running it out of a cigar box, and let's look carefully at how money is flowing in and out of the cigar box. So, uh, you know, why do we need to know all this stuff? Well, because the purpose of financial accounting is that companies will prepare their financial information based on gap accounting, and investors will look at that information, and they will interpret and form opinions on whether the company is doing well or badly. And oftentimes in managing the business, we have to think about how we're going to manage this process and how we're going to manage the perceptions of this particular audience. So one of the things that we'll talk about is once you have a system like this, what are some of the motivations that the company has and how might that actually affect the business? And one of the ways we'll answer that question is by looking at this set of pictures. And the first one is, here is this cartoon. And in this cartoon, what you can see is that there's two people talking and one of them is celebrating. And the reason they're celebrating is that the company beat Wall Street expectations. Now, all those of you who read the Wall Street Journal or look at the business press regularly know that routinely you get news stories about company so-and-so said their earnings for this quarter were $2.50 a share, and that is either ahead of the market's expectations or Wall Street's expectations or behind Wall Street's expectations. And if you're working particularly at a publicly traded company, this is a critical set of forces that drive what's going on in the business, a lot of the businesses manage to make sure that they meet these particular expectations. Now, this is no different than anything else. All of you in your career have certain sets of expectations that you're trying to understand, meet, and exceed. They may not necessarily be financially based expectations. They may be expectations based on other things. But managing with finance and accounting is really no different than um, uh, managing expectations anywhere else. So, here, they're proud of the fact that they beat the expectations, but as we read on, we realize that the expectations weren't that high. Right? So you're actually managing both pieces. You're managing both the results as well as the expectations themselves. And the net result of this, on a more serious note, is a picture that looks like this. Now, 
Many of you might look at this picture and you might notice that this looks very familiar. This looks like what we would normally call a bell curve, right? And a bell curve is uh, what we call a normal distribution. Well, what I want to point out to you is that this distribution is a very special one. It's not exactly a bell curve, although it looks kind of like a bell curve. Here's what's different about it. The typical bell curve reaches its peak at zero. And this one is shifted off to the right a little bit. It reaches its peak at like 0 0.01 or 0 0.02. And what you can notice is there are more places and there's more space to the right of zero than there is to the left of zero. Just to the left of zero, there's a big drop off over here. Let me explain what all this is. Okay, and to explain that, we have to read this graph a little carefully. On this axis down here, I have something called the change in earnings interval. What's an earnings interval? Well, it's basically what your company earned this year for this quarter minus what your company earned for the same quarter last year. So when that company comes out and says, this quarter we earned $2.50, they usually say, and last year for the same quarter, we earned $2.45. So if there's a company that earned $2.50 this year, last year they learned $2.45, they would be placed into this 0 .05 bucket because they are five cents per share ahead of last year's number. Okay? So if you're right here at zero, what it means is that this year you earned exactly what you earned last year. If you're to this side, it means you did better than last year. And if you're to this side, you did worse. So what does this actually say? It says in most, and, and, and the way we drew this chart was we basically took this bucket and we looked at every publicly traded company for a 30-year period starting in 1997 and working back. And over those 30 years, over those quarters, if a particular company in a particular quarter went to five cents greater, we put them here. And then we added the next one and the next one. So the height of these bars is, how many companies in how many quarters reported exactly this number versus exactly minus five? Okay, so what you can see is that typically the most common thing that happens is companies usually outperform the previous year's quarter by just a little bit, one or two cents. And they usually don't miss by one or two cents, right? And generally what's happening here is that most companies know that there's an expectation that you have to be doing better on a consistent basis. And what they're going to be trying to do is they're going to both be trying to manage the business and manage their finance and accounting processes in such a way that they end up over here and not over here. This is really, as I said, no different than any other type of expectation management that happens. Companies generate this picture because they're trying to manage people's expectations, and then once they know that the expectation is to at least exceed last year's number, they're going to find a way to try to do a little bit more than that. In the, in the program, we'll talk about the mechanisms by which we use we manage this process, and we'll talk about and, 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 and we'll talk about some of the pros and cons of doing this. This is not what we call a free lunch. You know, you can't just do this without any cost whatsoever. And here are some of the types of costs companies get. You're coming up on a year end, and you're really close, and you're worried that you're not going to make the target of beating last year's number. You also have on your schedule a plan to invest a bunch of money in some new research and development to come up with a new set of products. Companies will often say, well, we're going to have to delay doing that or not do that at all just so we can make our numbers. And if you think about it, that's a very frustrating thing if you happen to be the business person who's dealing with that decision because you know the reason you want to do this research and develop this new product is because it's good for business. But in the name of making the numbers, you're going to give that up. So you're going to make the short-term numbers and possibly sacrifice the long-term as a result. And part of what we want to do in the program is to start thinking about those types of situations and thinking about what our options are to manage those results. Because success in business means both meeting short-term targets and meeting long-term targets. And that requires not just an understanding of finance, but it requires being able to combine an understanding of finance with an understanding of the rest of the business. And that's why I kind of go back to this thing from the beginning where I say the days where you could take your finance issues and throw them over the walls of a finance person, those days are gone. Because
because the pressure to be successful and the pressure to meet targets is constantly increasing in business. And the ability to do that requires not a knowledge purely of the business or knowledge purely of the finance, but it requires both. And it requires you not only to think in the short term, but it requires you to think in the long term at the same time. And that's a tall order. So those are the kinds of issues we're going to be talking about in the program. Uh, we're going to not just talk about those through a lecture, but we're going to talk about through uh, those through a whole set of methods. We've been working with executives, particularly executives from non-financial backgrounds at the Columbia Business School for many years. We have, as a school, a long history of strength in accounting and finance. In terms of some of the people that we've trained, probably the most recognizable name that's studied here at the Columbia Business School is Warren Buffett. But we have run programs such as mastering management, such as finance and accounting for non-financial executives, for many, many years, and I've been involved with those programs since the year 2000. I've taught in those programs since that time. Uh, and what I know is that we have a long history of particularly helping people who are not people who think of finance or accounting as their forte, and we help them become conversant in the subject. We do it in a variety of ways. You should not expect when you come to Columbia that you'll sit in a seat and just hear someone talk the whole time. We will use a lot of examples and methods and discussion that get away from this lecture-based teaching mode. One of the primary things we'll do is we'll use the case method. We will turn everything we do into a set of examples and a set of practical realities so that we work on application, not just concept. Throughout the Mastering Management program, there is the possibility, it's an option in the program, you don't have to do it if you don't want to, but there is a possibility that you could bring with you a project related to your business that you're interested in studying, and you could, through the program, work on that project and apply the concepts that we're learning to gain insights into that process. That's called the Applied Personal Project in the program, and it's a very useful tool to practice what you're learning. In most classes, we will be, in addition to cases, working on some in-class exercises, some simulations, some negotiations, uh, some other activities. So if, for example, you're worried about coming back to school after having been away for a long time and said, well, I don't know if I can sit still in a seat for you know hours and hours on end, let me assure you that while there will be some times where there will be lectures, we will be interspersing that with a lot of activities. So most of our classrooms, you're not in your seat for that long. Concepts such as finance and accounting are complicated. Sometimes they're technical. Sometimes it takes more than one time, and it takes asking a lot of questions over and over again until you get the answer. We provide some additional resources for people. These are all voluntary resources. You don't have to do these things. Um, but if you need additional work, we often organize webinars such as this and a professor comes on and works with a group of students that want to spend extra time reviewing some of the concepts that they're having trouble with. We also have, because we are an academic institution, because we have lots of PhD students, we also have the possibility that you know we could partner you with someone for a few hours here and there who might be able to go over some of those concepts with you uh, on more of a tutoring basis, either in a small group or or one-on-one, -on -one, depending on what the situation and what the need is. So we have a whole series of resources. Our goal is not to just say, hey, it's important to know this, so let's just throw you in the deep end and you figure out how to swim. Our goal is to actually find ways to structure things so that once you're convinced that this is an important thing for you to do, we want to give you the resources to be successful at learning those things. Okay? So all in all, why should you want to know the finance and accounting components? Let me keep it simple. What's, problem, what's often going on in business is that you often get reports that come across your desk or in email. And for whatever reason, you just skip those over and you go on to doing other things. You often have to interact with people in finance and accounting. And if you're not a finance and accounting person, it can, almost, it can be a very frustrating experience because you feel like they're speaking a different language. Sometimes those finance and accounting people are trying to push you to do something you don't want to do, and you often don't have the tools or the language or the skills to push back. What we want to do with this program is to give you those things. We want you to be able to stop and read those reports and know what's going on in them. We want you to know, based on that, how to ask the right questions 
and, uh, and make intelligent comments. We want you to be able to interact effectively with finance people, and we want you to be able to push back when necessary and have the skills to do that. We think all of those are important things for someone who wants to be effective and successful in a business. Uh, let me just close by giving you a couple of comments from some of our past participants. You can see from the first comment that people actually do say, yes, based on the knowledge I gained here at Columbia, I'm actually starting to look at some of those things that I've blown off before, and I'm starting to ask questions. And even my boss, who was a former CFO, was very impressed by what I was asking all of a sudden. Um, you know, another person said, you know, uh, they really found this very useful in a whole set of practices. And what was interesting about the person who made this comment was that they were not working in a for-profit organization. They were actually working in a not-for-profit organization. I guess they came in with a little bit of skepticism. How can something that is business-focused be relevant to me? And I think what they found was lots of relevant takeaways. So with that, let me pause and let me turn it over to Jason and ask him uh, to uh, begin with questions. Sid, thank you so much for the great presentation today. Um, I just want to let folks know that we are recording the session. So we'll be sending out a recording of everything that you've heard today so that you can review it, of course, share it with colleagues, and of course, we'll invite you to um, respond with any questions you may have um, after, after watching the recording. And you can continue to submit your questions using the chat um, interface just below the presentation here. Sid, we do you have, we, we're a little bit over, but I think it was well worthwhile. This uh, amazing content really gave us something to think about. Um, I think a, a gentleman, uh, Kevin, asked earlier, you just touched on this, but maybe we can just touch back on this question and expand it a little bit more. He's asking about tax-exempt in nonprofit organizations. Do they have any use right. for tax accounting? Yeah, let me, um, uh, let me just recap the question. My understanding of the question is, do tax-exempt or not-for-profit organizations have to have any use for tax accounting? And the answer is absolutely, for a slightly different reason. Um, one is that they have to still file forms that demonstrate what they're doing. There is still cash in those organizations. There's still money moving through those organizations. And so they have to, first of all, demonstrate that they are functioning in ways that satisfy their tax-exempt status. And for that, there's a whole set of reporting that they have to that they have to undertake. Right? They also have to prepare a set of financial documents because they often have other stakeholders beyond shareholders that want to know where the money is going to and what it's being used for. Um, you know, you may all be familiar with, for example, the ice bucket challenge. Uh, the ALS Foundation that did that actually came under a bit of scrutiny and critique because it was clear that this was raising a lot of money for them. But when people started looking at their financial reports, what they were realizing is that actually a fairly small percentage of the money that was coming in in the form of donations was actually going out in terms of benefit. Right? So both financial accounting and tax accounting, you might say, well, I don't need financial accounting because I don't have investors. And you might say, I don't need tax accounting because I don't, I'm a not-for-profit and I don't pay tax. Well, in both cases, there are still concerns and issues that parties that are interested in the company will have that will require you to basically continue doing both those types of accounting, and there's, there's actually use for that in France. It's a slightly different use. It's a slightly different audience, but it's still the same accounting, basically. Sid, so, uh, a question just came in that, that I think is really important in terms of talking about how Columbia approaches teaching in terms of uh, being able to really go back to the workplace and apply what you've learned. Um, Scott is asking, is saying that we mentioned that the technical aspects can be very daunting, and the program sort of minimizes in-depth technical work with more theory. Um, he's asking if the program will be challenging um, from someone who's coming from a very technical background. I wonder if you might just talk about how we're teaching it in terms of how much is theory, how much is practical application. Well, I would say we stress both pieces. We are, at the end of the day, still an academic institution. So we never want, for the purpose of technical ease, to dilute the content to where it's actually incorrect, just because it's easier. Uh, we want things that have intellectual integrity in their ideas. 
And Scott, specifically to your question, uh, we've, we have always had in the program a mix of people with different backgrounds. And we've always found a way to make it interesting for everybody. Um, from the, the perspective that every single one of the people in front of you has as much technical skill as you could possibly ask for, even if they don't necessarily show it off every step of the, of the day. So if there are questions that need to go in that direction, they can go that way. If there are offline conversations that, that you know, and sometimes we do tend to move this into a smaller setting, like a webinar or something like that. The reason being, if you've got a classroom of 30 people, and you have five people interested in a particular technical thing, if you spend all the time talking about that, you're going to see all the other people's eyes completely glaze over and they're going to be completely lost. So oftentimes we'll do that supplementing on both ends of the distribution additional resources to support people who want additional technical challenge. Also where this comes in, Scott, is that if you were more technically inclined and you started actually working on a project through the program, you'd actually realize that there you have no choice but to confront the technical issues. And we actually have support from our faculty and from a set of coaches that we use through the project process. And there, you can discuss essentially anything technical and deal with any technical challenge you have. Um, I have had, I, I teach in our executive MBA program. And we, uh, introductory accounting is a required course with no exemptions allowed. And I've had people in the course who are CFOs people in the course who are partners from accounting firms. They're just moving into roles where they're going to need to know more of the marketing stuff or the strategy stuff. And I always love it when they come back and say, you know, the approach you're using to really get people to think about the accounting and not just, you know, you know, you know, not just concentrate purely on either application or the technical detail, but think more deeply about the subject has been great because they've actually set a question I've had all through my career, and I'm a CFO now, or I'm a partner in an accounting firm now, saying this, and I've never really felt comfortable asking those questions. And I can actually ask those here and get answers to those. So um, the situation you're talking about is a challenging situation, but we think you will find sufficient challenge. And if you don't, if you let us know, I'm sure we can find a way to amp it up for you. Uh, as far as moving on now to Jason's discussion, about theory and practice, uh, that's really, I mean, sort of a, a general um, motto that we have here in executive education is learn it on Friday, use it on Monday. And really, that's the goal we try to hold ourselves up to. We try to hold ourselves to a goal that our job is not just to give people a set of techniques or tools, but to make sure they understand it in sufficient depth that they could actually turn around and use it in real life. We try to facilitate that through the project. We've had numerous you know, contacts back from people who were in a program a year or two back. And they say, you know, this program really changed how I look at things, and it changed how I do things. It changed how I e relate and apply uh, what I do to the world that I'm in. And that's really our goal. We see ourselves overall, you know, if you think about what the mission of the Columbia Business School is, we see it is. We see ourselves as a bridge between theory and practice. We, have, we are deeply rooted in theoretical ideas, but we're deeply committed to making sure that we can, we can make those accessible to a practical audience that is dealing with real business issues. Sid, uh, just one more question for you, and then we'll, uh, we'll conclude our time today. Again, thank you for taking the time to talk with everyone, answer questions. I, I'm actually just sort of wondering about the uh, experience that you mentioned earlier your own personal experience, you came up marketing business operations and realized you needed to know more about finance and accounting. I think a lot of folks in the room are in that kind of situation. They've come up through um, an area of expertise and are realizing they need to, to broaden their skill set. If that person is considering this program, do they need to do anything in advance in terms of pre-work or preparation just to be ready for that day one of finance? or? Is, is day one really starting at sort of um, at, at a base level for anyone who comes in? What do you, what would so, you advise? So the structure of the program is that in most cases, we don't send out, you know, if you think about a traditional school experience, you come to class and then you get homework. We, our homework is pre-work, not post-work. So once you're signed up for the program, you will have a set of things and we will 
you know, have resources to support you preparing those things. There'll be a set of case studies you need to read, a set of materials you need to cover. Um, and, and in most cases, we make those available before you come into class. So there's actually work you do before you come into class so that the classroom experience, if you think about it, this is sort of an upside down or flipped approach, right? We basically want you to access a set of materials and start thinking about those materials before you walk into the room. And then we want to structure what happens in the room to be a discussion where we can actually digest that material, right? So what you'll see if you're in the program in terms of preparation is that for every time you're going to be coming back to Columbia, the week before or two weeks before, you're going to get a set of materials handed to you. And you're going to say, please prepare these things in preparation for our next set of classes. And it's going to be a little bit different, but I think it'll inherently be a lot more interesting because it's sort of like, you know, many of you in your workplace, when you go into a meeting, you do a lot of preparation before you walk into the meeting. You may have something to do afterwards as well, but you realize pretty quickly in most organizations the importance of not walking into a meeting unprepared, and it's going to be the same kind of structure we're going to use here at the business school. That's great. Sid, thank you again for uh, answering all these questions and for a great presentation, uh, really highlighting how understanding you know, finance and accounting can really, uh, really change your orientation around all aspects of the business. Um, so we do appreciate that. And again, I'll just for convenience, I'll share the link to the program page. Mastering Management, again, it's a 12-day program taking place on Fridays and Saturdays over a period of four months, um, starting February 6th. We're now accepting applications. Um, we, our Learning Solutions team will be happy to talk to you um, to help guide you toward this program or another program within our portfolio. Um, so I do thank all of you for being with us and for the good questions and for listening and taking the time to participate. And Sid, uh, thank you very much for being with us today. We appreciate it. Thank you, Jason, for putting all this together. And thanks, everybody, for taking the time. I know we ran a little bit long, but I do hope it was productive and helpful to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, everyone. Take care.